It is good to be with you again tonight. I hope you're all doing well. If you have any updates to the prayer concerns, I hope you will get in touch. Please also remember that we are continuing to meet for two worship services every Sunday at 9 o'clock and also at 1030. And that gives us some room to spread out in the auditorium so we're not too crowded in there. We can keep some distance between each other. And it helps if we sign up ahead of time to not all be at the same service. So I hope you can do that. That would really help. And that is through the website, also through the email that's sent out every Saturday evening. If you have any trouble with that, get in touch with me or with Kenna. We'd be glad to do the best that we can. If you are listening by phone tonight, if you need any help with this, if you have anything that we need to be praying about, I hope that you will give me a call at 608-224-0274. So I hope you can get in touch in that way or use the contact information on the screen. Tonight we get back to our study of the book of Luke. And by way of review, we know that Luke is the author. He was a medical doctor. Paul refers to Luke as the beloved physician. And we know that he makes a point of researching his account. He was not an eyewitness. He is a second-generation Christian. He also makes a point of including groups that were often excluded or overlooked or abused or persecuted in the ancient world, widows and women and Gentiles and Samaritans, as well as a number of various sick people. Uh, last week, we looked at the last half of Luke chapter 18 through the first paragraph of Luke chapter 19. We saw Jesus predict his death and his resurrection, which the apostles did not understand at all. Jesus laid it out, and it went completely over their heads. We had the healing of the blind men in Jericho. Then we had Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, of course, was the wealthy chief tax collector. He was the man who climbed a tree because he was too short to see Jesus over the crowds. And when Jesus came into view, Jesus invited himself into Zacchaeus' home. And by the time Jesus leaves his home, Zacchaeus has a complete change of heart. He promises to give half of his possessions to the poor and promises to repay four times as much if he's defrauded anyone of anything. And at the end of that paragraph, we had Jesus state his mission very clearly. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And we learned at the end of class last week that if that is Jesus' mission, then it should also be our mission to go out there and spread the gospel and get the word of God out there as much as we can, seeking the lost and directing them to the Lord. Tonight we continue with the rest of Luke chapter 19, and so we hope to wrap up Luke 19 tonight. We will be using the harmony of the Gospels. In case you're interested, as I've pointed out a number of times, the Harmony is available on Amazon for around $25. You can get that in a couple days normally. And it's basically just the four Gospel accounts lined up in four columns parallel to one another so we can compare and contrast. And it's going to be especially helpful as we move into the last week of Jesus' life. There are some chronology issues here, a lot of uh, seeming contradictions that are very easily explained if we put them side by side. And that saves a lot of time and effort having them right there arranged on the same page. And it's all there in chronological order. Uh, however, uh, in the Harmony, we don't have anything between Luke 19.10, where we left off last week, and Luke 19, verse 11, where we pick up this week. And so we move over this evening to Luke 19, verses 11 through 28. And I, I hesitated for a little bit, putting this much text on one screen. A lot of words there, but all of it really goes together. It was hard to cut this in half and look at it in two sections. So as usual, I hope you'll have your own Bibles open. And let's look together at Luke 19, verses 11 through 28. Luke 19, 11 through 28. While they were listening to these things, Jesus went on to tell a parable because he was near Jerusalem. And they supposed that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. So he said, a nobleman went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself and then return. And he called ten of his slaves and gave them ten minus and said to them, do business with this until I come back. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. When he returned, after receiving the kingdom, he ordered that these slaves to whom he had given the money be called to him so that he might know what business they had done. The first appeared, saying, Master, your mina 
has made ten minus more. And he said to him, Well done, good slave, because you have been faithful in a very little thing. You are to be in authority over ten cities. The second came, saying, Your mina, master, has made five minas. And he said to him also, And you are to be over five cities. Another came, saying, Master, here is your mina, which I kept put away in a handkerchief. For I was afraid of you, because you are an exacting man. You take up what you did not lay down, and reap what you did not sow. He said to him, By your own words I will judge you, you worthless slave. Did you know that I am an exacting man, taking up what I did not lay down, and reaping what I did not sow? Then why did you not put my money in the bank? And having come, I would have collected it with interest. Then he said to the bystanders, Take the mina away from him, and give it to the one who has the ten minas. And they said to him, Master, he has ten minas already. I tell you that to everyone who has, more shall be given. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. But these enemies of mine, who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them in my presence. After he had said these things, he was going on ahead going up to Jerusalem. In context, when we look at verse 10, where we left off last week, these people listening are the same ones who probably are the ones who had an issue with Jesus eating with Zacchaeus. And so in response to that, Jesus tells a parable. He's near Jerusalem. He's coming out of Jericho. These people are thinking that the kingdom of God is right around the corner. And so since they're thinking in terms of the kingdom, Jesus takes this as an opportunity. This is a teachable moment, we might say. And he tells this story. There's a nobleman, and this man leaves for a short time, an unknown amount of time, to receive a kingdom. And to us, that's rather unusual uh, to go somewhere to receive the kingdom that you're going to rule over here. Uh, back then, though, people made deals, a lot of wheeling and dealing going on. They were given political power through marriage or maybe through... Uh, other deals that were made. And so this man leaves to get a kingdom. But before he leaves, he needs to arrange for his affairs to be managed in his absence. So we've seen this picture before, or at least a variation of it in the other accounts. The, the man brings in 10 of his slaves. In this account, a little bit different from the other. Uh, but in this one, he brings in 10 of his slaves. He gives each of them a mina. And he tells them to basically uh, keep the place running while he's away. You know, do business with this until I come back. That is the command. And that's in verse 13. As I understand it, a mina was equal to about 100 days wages. And so again, putting this into our formula as we have before, roughly $15 an hour, 10 hours a day in today's economy. Uh, we're talking roughly $15,000 given to each of these 10 slaves in today's economy. It's... Uh, it's not an absolutely huge figure, uh, but that's a lot of money, isn't it? $15,000, that's a lot of money. It's not enough to retire on for the rest of your life, uh, but it is significant, it, it, and it's a good test. How will you handle $15,000? I remember back when we got my wife's car, uh, it is uh, 2009, so that would be either the end of 2008, beginning of 2009, I think is when we got her Corolla. Uh, we had a budget of $15,000, and that strikes me because that's roughly what this is. And uh, we came out of a Smart Toyota over on Odana Road, and I think our grand total taxes, everything, was fourteen nine ninety something So uh, uh, to keep it under fifteen grand, we had to uh, whack the automatic windows and the locks. You know, it's got the cranks and the five-speed manual transmission, and it is a car, and it gets us from one place to another. Uh, but I point that out because that's roughly the amount of money that each slave was given, about $15,000 in today's economy. <laughs> they were given a 11-year-old Toyota Corolla to, uh, to manage. Um, at this point in verse 14, we seem to have something almost unrelated. It kind of wanders here just a little bit as we find that the citizens uh, where he is currently living, they send a delegation to basically follow him on his journey. And their message to anybody willing to listen, hopefully it gets to the person who's thinking about giving him this kingdom, their message is, we don't want this man reigning over us. We don't like him. And so this is the harassment squad. They're going out there trying to give him a bad name. They're following along to make him look bad, uh, I'm guessing, so that 
uh, whoever is about to give him this kingdom might think twice about it. So they're there just to give the king or future king uh, some bad publicity. Uh, eventually, this ruler receives his kingdom. He returns home to actual, actually do the ruling. And notice when he gets back, he checks in on these servants. And so there is some accountability going on here. The first one has turned his one mina into ten minas. And that is absolutely huge. So he takes his $15,000 and he turns it into $150,000. And that is a huge profit, isn't it? We would love that. If I took $15,000 to a financial advisor and I left on a trip, and when I come back, I'm leaving on a trip this coming Sunday, and if I leave him fifteen grand and come back and he says, well, you know, I turned it into one hundred fifty grand for you, I would be absolutely thrilled with that, and I think all of us would be to get that kind of return. And so this ruler puts this slave in charge of ten cities, and his idea is if he can do that with fifteen grand or one mina, a hundred days wages, uh, imagine what he can do ruling some cities, and so he gives them that responsibility. Uh, obviously, if this ruler has just received a kingdom, he's coming back, and he needs to get things up and running. And so he needs people that he can trust. He's looking for responsible people to put in charge of some areas here. So the, the minas were a test, and this first servant absolutely passed the test. Notice the second slave comes in. And he's turned his mina into five minas. And that's also very, very good, isn't it? If you had $15,000 and turned it into, I'm not good at math, I think it's 75,000, right? So 15, five times, 75, so 75K. Um, if you could do that with a financial advisor, that's also awesome. And that, that's a good return. And so this slave is then put in charge of five cities. And so there is some proportion there. The guy who really got it done is given more responsibility. The guy who does really, really well, but not as good as the other guy, is given some responsibility, but not quite as much. And so, uh, like the first, he also has some, some good skills. He has some ability to take some risk and, and manage, and he is a responsible person. However, in verse 20, things take a turn for the worse, don't they? And we have one of the slaves. We don't even have a report from all ten. We just have the one, the second, and now number three. It all falls apart there. And so one of the slaves comes in, and he returns his mina in a handkerchief, untouched, and he rips on the ruler. And, and based on what he says, I don't know if insulting the ruler was really the best thing to do at this point, but he accuses the ruler of being an exacting and unreasonable man, and so he's blaming his boss, isn't he? I, I can't believe how terrible you are as he comes and tries to explain how he came back with the exact same amount he was given. And so instead of being diplomatic, instead of thanking the ruler for entrusting him with this great responsibility, thank you, sir, but I just couldn't do it. I mean, that could have at least maybe gone a little bit better. I don't know. But instead of doing that, there's none of that. But instead, he's insulting the man. I knew you were a terrible human being, so therefore, I didn't do anything with this money you gave me. That's, that's a horrible response. Starting in verse 22, then, the ruler turns this around. And as I see it, he's not agreeing, yes, I'm an unreasonable man. He's, he's turning it around, and he's basically judging the slave by his own words, which he does. And so instead of entrusting the slave with uh, any more of anything, like he does the other two, he orders that the one mina be taken away from him, and given to the man with 10. And again, thinking about that in modern terms, if I have two financial advisors, one multiplies my money by 10 and the other by 5, anything I have left, who am I giving it to? Probably the guy who did the best. And so instead of entrusting this slave with anything more, uh, he takes that one mina away and gives it to the 10 mina man. At this point, the bystanders object. And that's always interesting to me to... Uh, notice how bystanders who have no skin in that game, they have, <laughs> they have nothing on the line here, bystanders can object to what somebody else does with their own money. Isn't that interesting? They didn't earn it. This doesn't affect them in any way as far as we know, but they think they have a say in this, which they don't. They think it's not fair. And again, how does it hurt them that some other guy has 11 minas instead of 10? It, it doesn't affect them, really. And in fact, the ruler explains that to everyone who has, more shall be given, but from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. 
And remember, this is not random. But instead, the 10 minus man uh, did something incredible to multiply his minus. The other guy reacted in fear and with excuses. That is not the kind of person you want to put in charge of anything because it will just get worse from there. So he is undeserving of any more responsibility. And again, if I give a financial advisor $15,000 and come back in a few years and he says, well, I know you're a terrible person, so um, here's the check that you gave me for $15,000. I, I was too scared to invest it. Uh, I'd be irate um, because what has that done to us? It's taken our $15,000 and now inflation has most likely happened and now our 15000 is worth only 10000 or less. And we see how that goes. We would be really mad because we could have given it to somebody who could have done something with it. And then we seemingly uh, randomly get back to the protesters. Uh, the, the ruler orders that the whiners from verse 14 be taken out and killed. And I kind of think, what in the world? I, I mean, to make any sense of this, I think we need to remember that the first hearers of this story are most likely those who complain that Jesus was going to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Remember that? Just in that last paragraph we ended with last week, when Jesus invited himself into Zacchaeus' home, they said, oh, he's going to be the guest of a man who's a sinner, and they were all upset about that. Well, I'm guessing then that these people might have seen themselves here. I mean, anybody with any level of wisdom can hopefully see what Jesus is getting at. You people whining about me eating with Zacchaeus, you're the guys getting whacked in this parable. And it seems that the rest of it with the minas probably has something to do with Jesus establishing his kingdom. Uh, even in that crowd, some listeners were more responsible and more hardworking than others. And with just a short time left until his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension back into heaven, Jesus is looking for some people to lead. He's like this king coming back from a, a nation with uh, the new ability to govern, and he's establishing his kingdom, and he's looking for leaders. He's looking for people like the Ten Mina Man. And at the same time, Jesus has no plans to deal with excuses. He doesn't have time to deal with that. And so he's looking for responsible people. And so, you know, that's our guess of what this probably means. And I say this because Jesus doesn't explain this parable as he does many of the others. But I would come away from this with two lessons. Number one, it's a warning to those who would reject Jesus as being their king, which many of these people are about to do in the very near future. And then secondly, it's an encouragement to his disciples to use their kingdom resources wisely. Demonstrate to Jesus what you can do with what he gives to you. And the reason is he will entrust you with more. And Jesus needs good leaders in his kingdom. And, uh, and that's what we get out of this. Uh, we have been entrusted with the gospel. We want to be the ten mina man. We want to be the person who multiplies the blessings that Jesus gives to us. And again, I'm not talking actual money. If your talent is money, we've had people in the church through the years that have had the talent of making money. And if that's your skill, go for it. But if your skill is making the church building presentable for visitors by making sure that it's clean or mowing the grass or editing Bible correspondence courses or visiting people in prison or dropping off a lasagna <laughs> or whatever it is, we need to do the work of the Lord with all of our might and do the best we can to be the ten mina man. All right, we now come up to the last week before the Lord's crucifixion. In terms of the chronology in the harmony, notice how the next section, John 11, 55 through 12, verse 1, is labeled as section 185. That sounds like some kind of dystopian <laughs> novel. Um, anyway, section 185, if you go to the very back of the harmony, then taking that section number to page 348, uh, you might notice at the bottom of that page that section 185 represents a shift from the winter of AD 30 to the spring of AD 30. And in particular, the Passion Week is how it's labeled in the harmony and in many of the commentaries that we might look at today. Uh, today, when we hear the word passion, what do we think about? 
often we think in terms of romance, don't we? If we somebody's being passionate, you know, a certain picture comes to mind. Uh, being in love with somebody. But uh, the, the term Passion Week goes back to the Latin word for suffering. It is oh, well, interesting tie between <laughs> passion and suffering. Uh, it is the same root word, by the way, as our English words compassion or sympathy. The same concept there, to suffer with or alongside somebody. And so we've now arrived at the week of Jesus' suffering. The Passion Week. And I just say that by way of background. We'll see that term from time to time. If you have the harmony, if you're still there, notice uh, we have greater detail on page 349 as we have a more detailed description of what happens during Passion Week. It's broken down by day, uh, sometimes by morning and evening on that little chart we have there. I think on the right-hand side of the page. I don't have my harmony. I'm out here in the garage again in front of the woodpile. Uh, but I point that out because that chart on that page, again, um, I think page 349 at the back, uh, that chart might be helpful as we move forward in this study. Uh, in this passage, John 11:55 through 12, 1, back on page 174 in the Harmony, we find that the Passover is at hand. And this is a huge deal for the Jewish people. They're getting ready to remember and to celebrate the angel of the Lord passing over and not killing the firstborn in Egypt for anybody who had sacrificed a lamb and put the blood of that lamb around the doorpost as God had instructed. And this week will culminate with the sacrifice of a lamb. This, we referred to this in our Sermon on Blood just this past uh, Sunday. We plan on touching on that briefly again this coming Sunday. In John 11:55, we find many people came to Jerusalem to purify themselves. Uh, there was some preparation involved before they could participate in the feast later in the week. And as the people start to come into Jerusalem, they're talking about Jesus. They're cleaning themselves up after the long trip. They're getting ready to worship. And they're wondering whether he'll show up at all. People are talking about this. There's this guy, Jesus. He's doing things. And is he going to show his face? Uh, in verse 57, we find the Pharisees had given orders that if anybody sees Jesus, they are to basically turn him in so that they can take him into custody. So they're looking for an excuse to take Jesus out. And so that's what's going on then. Jesus, he shows up in Bethany. That's a village just out of, uh, outside of Jerusalem. And again, this is six days now before the Passover feast. If we go back to where we are in the Harmony on page 174, notice we now have some material in Matthew, Mark, and John that is not found in Luke. Uh, there are some interesting notes on the chronology in the footnote at the bottom of page 174. Basically, it's out of order. In Matthew and Mark, they put it where they do to try to contrast Mary's attitude with the attitude of the religious leaders. But John puts it where it goes chronologically. Luke just skips this altogether. Basically, Jesus is in Bethany at the home of Simon the leper, and a woman by the name of Mary comes in as he's eating. And she breaks this vial of expensive perfume, and she pours it over the Lord's head. Judas, though, objects to that. How dare this woman waste this expensive perfume and he claims that the perfume could have been sold for 200 denarii and the money given to the poor a denarius was a day's wage and so this vial of perfume is the equivalent of 200 days of working and again here in madison what does the average person make in terms of dollars in a 200 day period well that's hard to figure depending on your education experience what you're doing for a living and all that but again, if we take an hourly rate of 15 an hour for 10 hours a day, multiply that by 200 days, that bottle of perfume was perhaps worth around $30,000 in today's economy. Again, it's not exact, but have any of us ever even touched a bottle of perfume worth $30,000? Uh, I have not. <laughs> if you've touched a $30,000 bottle of perfume, I would love to hear about that. John, as the last one to write his gospel account, points out that Judas objects only because he had the money box and used to pilfer what was put into it. And I think that's the only place where we see this. That's the only way we know Judas was a thief. It's because of this we learn that Judas, the treasurer of the group, not only betrayed the Lord in a little bit, but he used to steal from their common funds. Uh, we know Jesus was supported financially by a number of women, among others, and that allowed him to leave carpentry. That was his trained profession, carpentry. 
but that allowed him to preach full-time instead of working with carpentry full-time. And so he went full-time for the last three and a half years. He could do that through the sacrificial giving of a number of people, including a number of women. Judas, though, kept those funds in a box, and he would regularly take advantage of people's generosity, uh, stealing those funds from the Lord himself. That, that is bold, isn't it? Uh, to take the Lord's money. Uh, nevertheless, Jesus tells Judas to leave the woman alone. Imagine what Jesus could have said. Do you think Jesus knew that Judas was a thief? Imagine what Jesus could have said here. You know, I'll tell you what, Judas, I know why you're concerned about this money, but Jesus doesn't go there. Um, notice this is where he says in Matthew's account, Why do you bother the woman? For the poor you have with you always, but you do not always have me. For when she poured this perfume upon my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Truly I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done shall also be spoken of in memory of her. And here we are. And we're talking about this woman 2,000 years later on the other side of the world. That's an awesome thing. That's what this woman did. She wanted to do this for the Lord. Many people consider it a waste. A lot of other things could have been done with this bunny, but she was the only one who did this. In John's account, we have crowds gathering in Bethany, hoping to get a glimpse of Lazarus, the man Jesus had raised from the dead a little while back. We also learn that the chief priests were trying to figure out a way to put Lazarus to death also, trying to kill him. Lazarus was evidence of Jesus' deity. Lazarus had to go. And this brings us now back to Luke's account. I know we've taken a detour through the others here to a passage that some have used to accuse Jesus of being a horse thief. All right? I read an article many years ago. I read it again um, just today. Uh, written by a woman from right here in Madison who helps lead a nationwide atheist organization. And she's written an article claiming that Jesus is a horse thief based on this passage we're about to read. So Luke 19, verses 29 through 38. Luke 19, 29 through 38. When he approached Bethphage and Bethany near the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples saying, Go into the village ahead of you. There as you enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one yet has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying that colt? They said, the Lord has need of it. They brought it to Jesus and they threw their coats on the colt and put Jesus on it. As he was going, they were spreading their coats on the road. As soon as he was approaching near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles which they had seen, shouting, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. So Jesus sends his disciples on a mission to steal a horse, doesn't he? Well, not exactly. Uh, before we accuse uh, uh, Jesus of horse thievery, we need to at least be open to some other possibilities. If there's some other way of explaining this that does not involve stealing a horse, uh, let's be open to those possibilities. And, and I think we start to see the main possibility in verse 30, in the Lord's description of the colt. He doesn't say, hey, you two go grab some horse for me, does he? This is not a generic uh, horse napping. Uh, but instead, he has specific knowledge about this particular animal, doesn't he? He knows something about this animal. Uh, this is a colt on which no one yet has ever sat. Well, how would he know that? In my humble opinion, Jesus has arranged something ahead of time. We aren't told everything that Jesus ever did. We have a tiny fraction of a sliver of a small percent of what Jesus did. And, and we aren't told a lot of things in Scripture. Remember, we only have a record of events from roughly 40 days in the life of Christ. And we don't even have everything that happened on those 40 days. We just have little bits and pieces out of three and a half years of ministry. There is so much we don't know, including how he knew that no one had ever sat on this colt. And so that's at least one possibility. All kinds of things could have happened here. I, I'm thinking 
somebody like Zacchaeus, who promised to give half of his stuff to the poor, probably said, you know, Lord, thanks for curing my blindness. If you ever need anything, let me know. Could have very easily been one of those situations. Uh, the other possibility is that Jesus is aware of this animal and sends his disciples out as a test of the owner. The owner might have been somebody like the rich young ruler or like Zacchaeus. He might have had resources. And so the question is, will he make those resources available to Jesus whenever needed? The Lord has need of it. And so the question is, will you supply the Lord's needs or will you turn him down on this occasion? Uh, besides, in Mark's account, in Mark 11, verse 6, Mark says, And they spoke to them just as Jesus had told them, and they gave them permission. Okay? This definitely is not stealing a horse. Permission has been granted. And that's something that we gain from having these accounts laid out side by side. It makes it a little bit easier to see that. If we look at Matthew's and John's accounts, we find the reason for all of this. It has been prophesied. Jesus riding into town on a donkey is the answer to prophecy. Matthew, by the way, is the one who mentions both a colt and a donkey. There are actually uh, two animals involved in this, although Mark and Luke only refer to the colt. And John refers to a donkey. As I understand it, Bethany is several miles from Jerusalem. A few possibilities here. It's possible Jesus switched between the two animals as he traveled. Uh, we also need to realize that colt does not necessarily mean horse. In my English-speaking mind, a colt is a horse. Well, a colt is a firearm, uh, but a colt is a horse. Uh, but I've learned this week that the word colt, as it's used in this passage, actually refers to a young donkey. And so when we combine the three accounts, we're referring to uh, a mother, <laughs> the mother donkey, <laughs> the older donkey, and her colt or foal or young donkey. As I understand it, Jesus rides the young donkey into town but the, the mom, perhaps we might say, is along for the ride to provide some sense of calm uh, for her son. That's kind of a weird way of putting it anyway. Um, Apologetics Press has a great article, apologeticspress.org. Great article on the whole donkey colt issue. And it goes into great detail explaining what's going on here. And I'll try to put that in the description of the video. I'll try to email it out if I remember to do that. Otherwise, feel free to look that up, apologeticspress.org, and search for donkey colt, and I'm sure you'll find it be probably the first article. Uh, all of this seems to be quite the procession, doesn't it? We think about the president coming to town. You got the motorcade and the ambulance and the armored cars, you know, and all that. In verse 36, people are putting their garments in the road. Matthew and Mark refer to the crowds cutting branches from the trees and laying those out in the road as well. This is where we get the idea of Palm Sunday. We don't celebrate Palm Sunday as a religious holiday. Jesus never told us to celebrate it as a religious holiday. But this is what happens. He enters Jerusalem on a colt, a young donkey, uh, that's walking on branches and clothing. This is obviously a sign of great honor. Uh, the people seem to know who Jesus is. He's a king. They're treating him like it. Uh, Luke tells us that they're praising Jesus for the miracles that they had seen. And I got a kick out of this in verse 38, all caps. And I was about to explain, um, it's a quote from the Old Testament. It's not necessarily shouting. And yet, you look at the caps, they are actually shouting in verse 38. They are shouting, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And so we got a double formatting uh, accuracy going on here. It is both shouting and uh, a quote from the Old John tells us that some of the eyewitnesses of Lazarus' resurrection are testifying. I've seen this man dead. I've seen him alive because of what Jesus did. And at the end of that account, John tells us that the Pharisees are getting more and more concerned. No good can come from all of this. In the harmony, you might notice Luke's column widens out at this point. We don't see this too often where one column starts filling up all three right there. It kind of oozes out there. Uh, but Luke has a bit more information here. So let's look at Luke 19, verses 33 through 44. Or 39 through 44, rather. Luke 19, 39 through 44. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But Jesus answered, I tell you, if these become silent, the stones will cry out. When he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, if you had known in this day, even you, 
the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side. And they will level you to the ground and your children within you, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. So as the crowds are praising Jesus as the king who comes in the name of the Lord, the Pharisees want Jesus to make these people be quiet. They can't be saying these things, Jesus. You need to make them be quiet. And Jesus, of course, refuses. I tell you, if these become silent, the stones will cry out. In other words, what these people are saying about me is true. And you know that just burn them up. He's walking, he's talking, and so as they come closer to Jerusalem, the city now comes into view, and Jesus weeps. As far as I can tell, there are three references to Jesus weeping in Scripture. At the death of Lazarus, here, as he weeps over the city of Jerusalem, and then there is a brief reference in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7. In the days of his flesh, he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his piety. We aren't told when that happens, but it seems to be related to the crucifixion, either the night before in the garden or perhaps actually as he is crucified. But here Jesus weeps over the city of Jerusalem. He's torn up over the fact that they are completely clueless as to what is about to happen. He sees it coming the Roman destruction of the city in 70 AD, but they have no idea. And it's about to happen, he says, because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. As I see this, he's referring to himself here. God has visited his people, but they're in the process of missing it completely. In fact, they're about to have him executed. And Jesus predicts what is about to happen very accurately. The city will, in fact, be besieged, and surrounded and leveled to the ground with the children still inside. The entire city will be completely demolished, even to the point where one stone will not be left upon another. And that's what happens about 40 years after this. Some of you know that a number of years ago we visited Rome and saw the monument uh, praising Titus for destroying Jerusalem, the Arch of Titus. And on that arch, there are images of Roman soldiers carrying off items from the temple, including the lampstand, uh, the, the trumpets, a distinctive table, if I remember correctly, and, and so on. What Jesus predicted actually happened. And as he thought about this, as he could see it in his mind, as he thought about what was coming, he wept over the city of Jerusalem. In the harmony, we have several verses from Matthew 21 and Mark 11 inserted here. For those of you who were with us last week, notice I got all caps in the upper books of the Bible there. They are now, that's fixed. Uh, in Matthew, we find the lame and the blind are finding Jesus in the temple, and he's healing them right there on the spot. The children are crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David. That makes the chief priest really mad and the scribes really angry. Jesus responds to them. He then goes back out to Bethany for the night, and so he's staying in Bethany but coming into the big city every day. It's kind of like Verona to Madison, kind of situation. And as he comes into the city, he curses a fig tree for not having any tr any fruit. It's not even the season for figs. And so he's using that tree, though, as a, as a picture of Israel, that the nation is like a tree without fruit. And this brings us back to the last few verses of Luke 19. So let's finish off Luke 19 tonight. Luke 19, verses 45 through 48. Luke 19, 45 through 48. Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out those who were selling, saying to them, It is written, And my house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a robber's den. And he was teaching daily in the temple, but the chief priests and the scribes and the leading men among the people were trying to destroy him, and they could not find anything that they might do, for all the people were hanging on to every word he said. This is the second cleansing of the temple. It might be easy to miss this if we didn't have the harmony because the first cleansing of the temple happens in John 2. That's right near the beginning of Jesus' ministry. This one comes in Matthew, Mark, and Luke near the end of his ministry. So at least three years have gone by. Uh, Mark makes it clear this happens on the next day after the triumphal entry. So we're now on Monday of the Passion Week in the harmony on page 179. 
Uh, you might notice right after it says uh, section 189, second cleansing of the temple, it then says CF period section 34. Uh, CF is an abbreviation for a Latin word confere or confer meaning compare. And so the authors of the harmony, the arrangers, the compilers are inviting us to compare this account with what happens back in section 34 in John chapter 2. And by way of comparison back in John 2, uh, Jesus actually makes a whip or a scourge of cords. He uses that to drive the money changers out of the temple. In both events, he turns over tables. Uh, some of you have perhaps seen the meme with the reminder, when people say WWJD, what would Jesus do? Remind them that turning over tables and driving out people with a whip is well within the realm of possibility. We don't always think of Jesus as being violent, but he was from time to time. When he needed to be, he could get it done, and we see it here as he physically drives out those who are selling in God's house. Remember, people would travel long distances to come to Jerusalem for the Passover. And instead of bringing their own lamb hundreds of miles, they would often just bring money. And they would then purchase a lamb when they arrived. And as you can imagine, that system was just asking for fraud and abuse. Uh, vendors would set up all around the temple. Prices were terribly inflated. You think about the $5 bottle of water at the movie theater kind of situation. Uh, many of the animals were far less than perfect. <laughs> they were missing eyes and limbs and who knows what. And there were differences in currency. And so you had to swap your money for local money at a terrible loss to the money changers. And then you'd end up overpaying for some unhealthy lamb that might have been missing an eye and covered in mange and limping or whatever. And Jesus comes in and sees this and he is irate. He's angry. Righteous, burning, jealous anger. And he brings in this quote from Jeremiah 7. In Jeremiah 7, by the way, we have Jeremiah's temple sermon. We studied this a number of years back. The Babylonians are gathered outside the city, ready to destroy it back then. And the people are coming to the temple for worship, thinking they're safe. This is God's house. Nobody can get us in here. And Jeremiah walks up and basically says, you people are, are, are all going to die. And I'm just paraphrasing there, but uh, that was his basic message in the temple sermon in Jeremiah chapter 7. And so there's some parallels between Jeremiah and Jesus. Jesus pretty much says the same thing here, especially when we consider this is so close to Jesus weeping over the city. The people are trusting in these external rituals, but they are missing the Son of God. They're, they're spending their time buying and selling for some lame lamb and they're missing Jesus standing right there with them. The Son of God is in their presence. In verses 47 to 48, Jesus spends most of his time teaching. He's at the last few days here. And the religious leaders are trying to figure out some way to destroy him. They had a hard time, though, because most of the people were hanging on to every word that he said. And that is where we leave it tonight. Thank you so much for being with us tonight, either online or on the phone. Uh, be sure to send me any prayer requests so I can get those in the bulletin. Next week, Josh will be teaching, and uh, he will be teaching for two weeks after that as well. So Josh will be teaching for a total of three Wednesdays in a row. Uh, Lord willing, I'll be heading out after worship this coming Sunday and heading west to see my sister out in Port Angeles, Washington. Uh, you basically take I-90 coming right here in Madison, I-90 to Seattle, where it dead ends, and then you keep on going. <laughs> I-90 hits the water, almost, and then you get on a ferry and keep going. Uh, the ferry takes about a half an hour to get across the little bit of water there past Seattle, and then you go for another hour and a half, two hours past that. Uh, when my sister first said she was moving two hours past Seattle, some of you know, I told her, um, that's impossible. Seattle is is at the corner of America. There is nothing past Seattle. And yet there is apparently something past Seattle. And so I talked to my sister this past Sunday. We talked about some hikes. Uh, she said she'd like to take me to the Buckhorn Wilderness. That's a place that uh, they've done a lot of searches and rescues. Uh, most of you know by now she volunteers with search and rescue out there in the Pacific Northwest. And uh, so if I go missing, have the authorities question my sister 
she has done something to me. Um, so she might have disposed of me somewhere out there in the Buckhorn Wilderness. But uh, I am looking forward to the trip. I hope to be back in a few weeks. I'll be with you this Sunday and then leave right after that if the Lord wills. But I hope you'll remember me in your prayers over the next several weeks. Uh, let us close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, as we have learned from Luke tonight, we pray that you would bless us and we praise you as the great and awesome God who has entrusted us with the gospel. There's a time coming when we will be held accountable for what we've done with this great treasure that you've given to us. And so we pray that we would be good managers, that we would teach, that we would share, that we would get the word out, that we would be good and faithful stewards. Thank you, Father, for our Christian family here in Madison. Some of us haven't seen each other for a while, some of us for many months, some of us may be feeling disconnected, and so we pray that we might find good ways to stay connected, that we might take the initiative, that we might find ways to stay spiritually strong. Be with those who are sick, be with those who are facing spiritual and emotional challenges. Allow us as your people to help and to encourage, not making people's burdens worse or heavier, but rather taking those on ourselves and, and sharing those loads. We come to you tonight in the name of Jesus, your Son, our Lord and our Savior. Amen.